we have a, uh, a final panel of four, four people. Um, Ryan, Ryan McConaughey from Third Way, who has a, which has a specific proposal for, for um, budgetary discipline. Uh, Jim Maxiner, a law professor from the University of Baltimore, who's a comparative law expert, is going to talk about how other countries deal with uh, obsolete law. Um, Don Elliott, who's the only uh, person who broke the rule against no PowerPoints, um, and also a Yale Law professor, and, and most importantly, um, uh, my landlord for purposes of, of uh, staying at his house when I'm in Washington. Um, and, and, and Bill Galston is, uh, is, uh, is batting cleanup for the, for the end of the program. So um, first up, I think, is Ryan. You, you ready? Yep. Great. Uh, thank you. I want to just thank um, Common Good and BPC for having me here today to talk about uh, uh, whether or not government needs a spring cleaning. And uh, in case anyone doubts that it does, uh, I just want to take a moment. Let's let's contemplate what uh, passes for victory in Washington these days. Uh, I'm going to quote here. Uh, congressional leaders and President Obama headed off a shutdown of the government with less than two whole hours to spare. Uh, I inserted the whole for emphasis. Uh, that's the first line of a New York Times article um, announcing that Congress had decided to keep the government's lights on in April uh, by passing a funding bill that was due in October of the previous year. Um, it's an example of how we make decisions now in Washington by lurching from crisis to crisis. Um, and it's also an example of how the budget process is broken. Uh, last year, we needed five continuing resolutions and two minibuses uh, to fund the government, both of which passed well after the October 1st deadline. Um, and this isn't just a result of the recent and heightened political rancor. Uh, since 1998, uh, Congress has funded government under CRs for an average of 127 days a year. Uh, since 1977, it's only completed the appropriations process on time four times. Uh, and in 2010, Congress spent uh, almost $291 billion uh, on programs that were technically expired and in need of reauthorization. Um, if this was just a matter of chaos for congressional staff, that would be one thing, and we could probably write it off to D.C. dysfunction, but it does have consequences. It's basically uh, but trying to budget while the house is on fire. If your, your house is on fire, you're focused on how are you going to put that out, uh, not the renovations you're going to make to increase your property value in six months. Um, biennial budgeting, which is something that Third Way, my organization, supports, uh, may help to break that, uh, that fire drill cycle of budgeting. Uh, under the system, uh, you'd have a two-year budget that's passed in the first year of a Congress, uh, and the second year would be devoted to an off year, essentially, for oversight. <laughs> Um, that could yield some real rewards. First, we would leave crisis budgeting behind. People rarely make their best decisions in a crisis, and uh, Congress is no different. Uh, secondly, uh, it would give Congress more time to reflect not so much on how much we're spending, which is really what dominates the headlines, but to how well we're spending it. Uh, and as some of the other panelists, like uh, Representative Cooper and, and Maya McGinnis uh, referenced earlier, that, that's a critical issue for us going forward. We're entering a looming era of austerity. Uh, and we don't face an either or. We have to borrow less, uh, but we also do need to spend more on critical areas for economic growth, like infrastructure, education, innovation. The only way to do that is to wring every last cent out of taxpayer dollars, and you can't do that without the type of aggressive oversight that an off year would allow for. Um, I think we're actually at a moment where the political incentives line up uh, in the right way for reform. Uh, I'm, I don't think I'm breaking any news here that Congress is not popular. Uh, I think it's, Senator McCain is quipped that approval is down to staff uh, and blood relatives. And, and so taking up the mantle of reform is actually a political winner right now, uh, reversing the trend of being, taking up the mantle of, of sort of bringing home the bacon. Um, so what would Congress do in the off year? Uh, obviously, there are hearings, investigations, site visits, things that are conducted now, but they're done in a reactive manner. They're basically done after a scandal breaks and hits the news. Uh, or after uh, a contract goes way over budget, um, this would allow you know, the off year would allow Congress to actually be proactive and look at things like the GAO's list of duplicative uh, programs or what they call high threat programs and start proactively ferreting out problems uh, before they hit the front page and before they cost taxpayers uh, money. Um, appropriators would become more familiar with the with the programs that they spend on. Uh, 
uh, the budget committee could move for, past the resolution process and towards uh, impenetrable but important issues uh, like how scores are constructed, uh, whether or not budgets are transparent, the accuracy of projections, uh, and things that uh, are, are the province of budget wonks but actually determine the fate of whether or not uh, a lot of programs get funded and, and get executed in the best way possible. Uh, support for biennial budgeting is also bipartisan. Uh, Senators Isaacson and Shaheen have introduced a bill to move to biennial budgeting. Uh, and there's something in it for, for factions within every party. Uh, fiscal hawks get to see every dime watched more closely. Uh, good government advocates get to see more attention paid to reform. And uh, for those of us who believe that government does have a role, we can begin to rebuild faith in the institution. Uh, Gallup recently released a report showing that they surveyed 25 major industries. Uh, government came in last between the ever popular, uh, even trailing the ever popular oil companies and lawyers. So we do need to re rebuild a little bit of faith in government. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, there's a little bit, uh, I, I began talking about how uh, chaos has uh, created a moment for this. And I think that in some ways that chaos may have actually set us on a journey towards biennial budgeting because we now have essentially a multi-year budget coming out of the uh, debt ceiling fight. We have the Budget Control Act, which sets discretionary caps for 10 years. It includes enforcement mechanisms and essentially begins this era of multi-year budgeting. And hopefully uh, we can seize on that and move forward to a more rational <coughs> system. So thank you. Great. Jim Maxheiner. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, I'm here to bring the foreign dimension to the forum, and I want to tell you basically and quickly two, two things. One, uh, foreign examples can certainly inspire and inform our efforts, and above all, they teach us that this is not an, a, an unusual event that we're talking about. This is what's something we should be doing all the time and all every day. The other thing is I want to tell you about a remarkable 17-year international project that's just now coming to its high point, the OECD's Project on Regulatory Policy and Governance, which is designed, in fact, to do a spring clean on the law in its member states. And we are the leading member state. Um, OECD, in case you don't remember, is a 50-year-old organization now, just celebrated its last, last year, its 50th anniversary. It goes back to the implementation of the Marshall Plan. It provides a forum in which governments can work together to share experiences and seek solutions to common problems. It's 34 member states and six applicants account for 80% of world trade. Well, first of all, I'd like to emphasize that foreign experiences really should inspire us. Some of the greatest works of Western law, Justinian's Corpus Juris Civilis, Napoleon's Codes, and Germany's Codes, were massive spring cleanings. A contemporary observer of the German Codes, the English legal historian Maitland said in cleanup language he used, was that the German codes put the German legal house in order. They swept away the rubbish into the dustbin, the rubbish which inevitably accumulates in the course of legal history. So we've got a, yet another century of rubbish to clean up. They do caution us about the difficulty of the task that we heard about in the last panels, or the panel before that. The mundane nature of cleaning up makes it, what Maitland said, the hardest of all commandments to follow. Yet he saw cleanup as one of the primary functions of a legislature. Exceptions are piled upon exceptions, but the old rules are never cleaned, uh, clean, cleanly abolished. So the problems we've had are problems that we've experienced for centuries in the world. The threat of not cleaning up is a system that collapses under its own weight. Uh, foreign experiences impel us to do this. We need to clean up to keep our system up to date. We heard the uh, Representative Cooper talking about we want to continue to be a leading country in the world. We can't face modern times and compete with foreign rivals unless we have, what Maitland already said, modern ideas, modern machinery, and modern weapons. We won't lead the world long if our laws are obsolete and those of our rivals are up to date. Uh, Justinian uh, came in after the Western, the Roman Empire in the West uh, fell. In the, uh, he, in the sixth, sixth century, reformed the laws. They lasted another a millennium after that. Uh, so that's perhaps an endorsement on how it can work well. Now, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development is about to deliver to us, to the United States, an international commitment to clean up. Uh, earlier, uh, excuse me, later last year, the Consul uh, issued its draft recommendations, uh, among which is draft recommendation number five, which calls on member states to conduct systematic program reviews of the stock of regulation against clearly defined policy goals, including consideration of costs and benefits to ensure that regulations remain up to date, cost justified, 
cost effective, and fit for their purpose. That sounds a whole lot like what we've been talking about today. The draft report reminds readers who may have forgotten that once the recommendation is adopted by the OECD Council, expected to happen later this year, common practice accords all OECD recommendations great moral force as representing the political will of member countries. There is an expectation that they will do their utmost to fully implement the rec recommendation, although they do not have a strict obligation, legal obligation to do so. Well, we are probably the leading member of the OECD. When it celebrated its 50th anniversary, it was Secretary of State Hillary Clinton who was responsible for that celebration and who led the whole project. So the recommendation is not something that's come about just overnight. It goes back uh, to the recommendation of the OECD Council on improving the quality of government regulation 17, uh, 17 years ago. It established a cooperative program for improving regulation in member states, and it has been realized in many states already. The goal then was to improve the quality of existing stocks of rules. Between 1998 and 2004, o OECD produced 20 individual country reports. The 1999 synthesis report called upon governments to address the problem that good regulation can become bad regulation over time by giving more attention to reviewing, updating, and eliminating unnecessary or harmful regulation. In 2004, OECD began to follow up on with in, uh, country uh, progress reports in determining how well it had been implemented. This is the important thing, is these countries have already been doing these things. I'm going to tell you about a couple of examples. Uh, one thing that's really helped is in 2008, they partnered with the Commission of the European Union uh, in the Better Regulation in Europe, EU 15 program, to assess regulation in the 15 pre-expansion member states. 13 of those contemplated reports have now been released in the last year. Only Italy and Greece have remained unpublished. Uh, perhaps we can draw some conclusions from that. These reports offer to Americans valuable insights into spring cleaning and regulatory reform. I'm going to tell you now just about three. Uh, very quickly, and then mention the, there is, we weren't part of that later project, but there is a report on the United States from 1999 that's quite instructive. France gets high marks. The report concludes that the French government has made substantial and sustained efforts over time to codify the law, which sets France apart from most other European countries. It notes that France has created a higher codification commission. 40% of the laws in France today in force are grouped into almost 70 codes. Codification is widely recognized as a key instrument for making the law more visible and accessible and as a remedy for the proliferation of regulations. The OECD report continues, however, the experience of the last few years shows that codification has reached its limits and must now be more clearly associated with control over regulatory output. Not all legislation can be codified. In Germany, the OECD has similarly uh, given high marks. It identifies their both the action and the creation of institutions to systemize action. It reports that the federal government has engaged in a spring clean of the existing regulatory stock with significant results. Since 2004, there's been a significant clean that's resulted in a dramatic change. 2,039 laws have been reduced to 1,728 laws and similar effect in regulations. Uh, this is the greatest reduction since 1968. The report praises the bureaucracy reduction and better regulation program as a major new initiative of the incoming Merkel government in 2005. It, now this is, I think, particularly significant for what we're talking about. How did it accomplish that? Well, one of the ways was it created back in 2005 the Regulatory Norm Control Council, which is a group that consists of a mixture of government people, business people, academics, consumer advocates, and it has a significant role in new legislation and in looking back. The United Kingdom, which we've heard about good things about the PAYGO, uh, or one, one in, one out, uh, actually has not, doesn't get such good marks from OECD. Uh, it laments that although there are a number of useful initiatives, there's no systematic effort to consolidate or simplify the regulatory stock. It warns that the lack of any systematic effort uh, tends to uh, 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 make its, all their efforts uh, less effective. It calls for an approach tailored to the English system that needs to look at everything. Well, finally, I told you I'd tell you a few words about the report from 1999 on the, on, uh, the United States. And uh, it is actually surprisingly positive about the American system. It talks about how the, the, uh, it's actually, in many respects, does as well as others. Now, the interesting thing, though, is what, where they find 
the positives and where they find the negatives. Fortunately, our Congress people have left because that is where it finds the problem. It's very, uh, it, it says the United States faces formidable legislative, institutional, judicial, and structural constraints on good regulatory practices, but by yet, by most measures, the capacity are among the best, but, and there it praises specifically the Office of Management and Budget from 1999, who I think it's encouraging and hopeful that the then head of OMB is now the chief of staff as of this week uh, for the President Obama. The constraints that it sees, and this is the most troubling, and this gets back to the institutional changes that may be needed, uh, has to do with overcoming uh, the regulatory barriers. Uh, it, I also have to, before, I, the, the report also mentions that Philip K. Howard, his book on common sense uh, is on the money in terms of the, the current system's weak uh, in, in uh, terms of uh, allowing for common sense. That it, cost $20. No, never mind. No. <laughs> I got the less on Amazon used. Right. Uh, I think but, he meant the bribe. <laughs> oh, my oh, oh, I see. Yes, right. yes. But what it finds, it, it's basically positive towards the regulatory system. Where it it's, has trouble is that the, at the heart, the most severe regulatory problem is the quality of primary legislation. And it recommends that a high, primary, high priority should be placed on developing better evaluation and review procedure for major regulations and for legislation in particular. As noted, American laws are likely to be lower quality than subordinate regulations due to the imbalance in quality controls between the two instruments and the lack of any consistent evaluation of the performance of existing law. This is where I think we can get a, learn a lot from the legislative systems of other countries, which we have noted already in the 1880s are not in the hands of Congress in other countries, but in the hands of the government. And the government ministries keep track of what's going on. Government ministries, Department of Justice typically looks to make sure that they all fit together. That's the most radical change, uh, but that may be the one that eventually is necessary. So anyway, the, the final line is, yes, we should do it. Uh, we must do it to remain com competitive. We have something of an international committee to, uh, commitment to do it. And we can learn a lot by seeing how others have dealt with the problem, because they all have over the last 15 years. Jim. John Elliott. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I have been working on these problems for, for most of my career. And, and like James, I am a, a big fan of the uh, codification movement and, and uh, wrote an article in the NYU Law Journal in 2008 uh, about some successful examples, legislative revision commissions in the, in the state. I see David Pritzker from the Administrative Conference. Uh, administrative Conference is a good example of uh, some places that we have been successful in, in using codification to clean out uh, uh, obsolete law. But that's not what I'm going to talk about today. In my uh, in my seven minutes, I'm going to focus on a, a particular problem, um, and that is um, how do you actually do uh, spring cleaning? I love these metaphors, which uh, obscure um, actually what we're, what we're talking about. How do we do spring cleaning? And I think one of the things that's been uh, talked about is you, you can't necessarily do spring cleaning just by passing a law that declares that a program or an agency is going to go out of existence. So I'm going to talk about how you might uh, actually do this with one particular kind of uh, obsolete law, uh, and that's the one that Philip identified first. Um, that is a law that's obsolete because it's supported by, um, Andy, why don't you do the next slide, Be because it's supported by, uh, by interest groups, or Jim Cooper gave the perfect example of the, uh, the mohair that stuck around for a, a thousand years, or a hundred years. Lots of obsolete laws um, continue after the conditions that originally justified them, not just as happenstance or because we haven't had a sunset law, but because there are powerful interest groups that support them. Uh, this is typically called in the economic literature um, rent-seeking, uh, Tim, a term uh, that Gordon Tullock confirm, uh, um, invented, it would really actually have been better to call it rent retaining because the, the problem is not so much groups that are, that are seeking government rents um, but are, are retaining them. And there are many, many examples that can be given. 
Um, one of my favorites is the 2007 energy bill. We have uh, f subsidies for fossil fuels in the United States that are about four times greater than those for renewable energy, according to the Environmental Law Institute. In 2007, essentially all the environmental and public interest groups came together to try to abolish these subsidies for, for fossil fuels with basically what I would call a frontal assault. Um, and they were able to get it through uh, one House of Congress, but not to get it uh, enacted. So sometimes the, um, the frontal assault technique of just taking away the rents that a powerful interest group has supporting an obsolete law doesn't work. Next, next slide. Um, this was really described by George Stigler, a Nobel Prize winning economist, who basically said it was more than just happenstance that often relatively small groups that benefit from a program have more, po have more power than uh, diffuse majorities, and he argued that it was uh, inherent. Um, one of the problems uh, we've talked about once a regulation has been enacted, um, it's, it's sunk cost for those that are complying with it. Uh, it's even worse than that. It's not only a sunk cost for people who are complying with it, it's an entry barrier for others to come in and, and compete with them. So once a company has complied with the regulation and has spent the money to do that, uh, it may support the regulation continuing because it doesn't want its competitors to, to have a, uh, not, not to have the same uh, problems that it did. So how do you deal with this? Well, it's what I call financial jujitsu. Jujitsu is a Japanese fighting technique in which a less powerful opponent overcomes a more powerful opponent by redirecting the force of the more powerful opponent and actually using it against it. And there are a number of successful examples of how this has been done. One of my favorites is how J.P. Morgan saved the United States economy in 1897. What happened in the Panic of 1897 is, as often happens, there was an arbitrage opportunity. And at that time, you could exchange your paper dollars for gold, but there was a difference in price. Um, and so um, arbitrageurs, uh, financial institutions, just kept exchanging paper dollars for, for gold. And the resources, the reserves of the United States actually got down to uh, $10 million. That was all that was left in the uh, Federal Treasury at the time. This created panic. And the President and the Secretary of Treasury called in the financial genius of the time, J.P. Morgan. We didn't have a uh, Federal Reserve Bank and asked him how, how the Republic could be, could be saved. And according to his biographer, uh, John Winkler, he spent a weekend smoking cigars and playing, uh, playing solitaire while he figured out how to, how to deal with this uh, problem. And what he ultimately came up with is that the United States would issue a new series of bonds with a very, very high profit. In some instances, you could buy these bonds at a 20% or 30% discount. So you could make a lot of money real fast. But the condition was you could only buy the bonds if you entered into a commitment that you would stop exchanging your paper dollars for gold. Now, there are two features to this jujitsu move. First of all, it uses the short-term greed of the arbitrageurs against them, hence the analogy to jujitsu. And number two, it gives them a stake in the long-term viability of the economy because, of course, if they continued to do what they were doing, the bonds would end up um, uh, being, being worthless. So next slide, please. So this is a strategy that has often been used successfully to um, break the hold of a special interest group on an obsolete law. Um, one of my favorite examples, because I was involved in it, was the acid rain trading program of 1990, um, in which we managed to get um, at least grudging support by the utility industry for a 50% reduction in pollution and going from being able to pollute for free to having to buy uh, allowances for the right to pollute. And one of the ways that was um, achieved was with partial compensation, with a, with a partial buyout, giving them basically half the allowances that they would need. Same thing with the recent Obamacare, the Affordable Care, Care Act. Um, they cut in the insurance companies. They cut in the pharmaceutical companies. If they had had the opposition they'd had, but all the insurance companies uh, and pharmaceutical companies had been against it as well, I predict it wouldn't have been 
possible to, uh, to, 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 to enact it. So this happens very many times uh, when we are going to uh, restructure um, retirement programs. Somebody mentioned the problem of uh, people who are over 55 and Social Security. How do we deal with that in the private sector? We don't typically take away all of their benefits. What we do is we offer them buyouts. Uh, we offer them a, sh a very attractive short-term buyout in exchange for their, their longer-term uh, entitlement. Now, um, it doesn't have to be full compensation. It can be partial compensation. Uh, you don't have to convert the opponents into, uh, into supporters. Uh, you can mollify them by giving them uh, partial compensation. And you don't have to pay them the long-term, the long-run value of the entitlement that they have under the existing system. The brilliant thing about it is it uses people's focus on short-term profits against them. That's really the jiu-jitsu move. So you offer them something that's very lucrative in the short run in exchange for um, getting them to uh, give up their, uh, their, their long-run position. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of the academic uh, literature, this is really um, just compensation meets the new corporate property. <laughs> A number of years ago, uh, Charlie Reich wrote a famous law review article about what he called the new property. And what he meant by that were entitlements, things like welfare benefits, handouts from the government. And he said they hadn't traditionally been recognized as, uh, as property, but they performed a function like that. I think it's time to recognize that there is something analogous to that on the corporate side. We have uh, a just compensation clause that recognizes that sometimes if somebody has property and we take it away from them, we have to give them compensation. Well, there are some things that don't really qualify technically, legally, as property, but once you've given them to a powerful interest group, you're not going to be able to change the law unless you find some way to essentially buy them out or get some, uh, some, some partial compensation. And this has been um, studied in a number of other countries around the world. Um, there seems to be an equilibrium between strict, uh, between, between government regulation, strict government regulation on one hand, and compensation. Um, when the Australians went to a partial compensation system, they, were, uh, they found that they were able to protect much more wilderness and endangered species because they mollified the political opposition. Um, so you can get more done sometimes with partial compensation than, uh, than having no compensation or, or no buyout. Um, those of you who are familiar with uh, economics will recognize that what I'm talking about here is what's called in the um, economics literature cozy and bargaining. Basically, if the government has an inefficient allocation of wealth entitlements, it's possible to get around that inefficient allocation through a system of bargaining, but it does um, enhance the wealth position of those who, who benefit. So um, I don't think this solves everything. Uh, I think many of the problems that uh, Jim Cooper talked about in terms of the structure of Congress, many of the other problems that others have talked about are very real, um, and this is not a panacea. But I think there is one very difficult and intractable problem in American history, and that is how do we deal with the entrenched power of special interests that maintains uh, obsolete arrangements long after the problem um, that gave rise to them is no longer there. And this may be one way to think about that problem. Thank you. OK, Bill Galston. Well, because I'm batting cleanup, I thought I'd offer some concluding reflections on our topic to sort of close the circle. Right. Uh, and you know, first, just asking us to think for a minute about the specific topic of, of this half-day meeting, namely obsolete laws. Now, obsolete laws are a category of bad or imperfect law. It's certainly not, certainly not the totality. Some laws are just poorly conceived from the start. They don't require a day to be wrong-headed. You know, they're, they're wrong-headed from birth. Uh, but other laws, and I take it this is the focus of what we're talking about, make sense at one point in time, 
but cease to make sense at a different point in time. Uh, and that raises the question, well, what is it that renders law obsolete? If we understand that, we'll have a clue about how we need to respond to this phenomenon. Well, just off the top of my head, here are four answers to that question. I'm sure there are others. Uh, the first is the growth of human knowledge. We may believe at one point in time that a certain substance is safe for human consumption, and at a subsequent point in time, we discover pretty conclusively that it isn't. Okay, and, and our structure of law and regulation needs, needs to adjust to that, and the slower it is to adjust, the more out of date the original law slash regulation becomes. Uh, the second factor, which is particularly pertinent today, I think, is economic, technological, and social change. Uh, and I could give hundreds of examples, but in, in the interest of time, I won't. This is one of the things that makes the regulation of the burgeoning information technology sector so very difficult, that the pace of change uh, outruns by an order of magnitude or two the pace of legislation and regulation. The third factor uh, that renders law obsolete is the phenomenon of globalization. Globalization renders a lot of law and regulation obsolete by providing new opportunities for exit from the purview of law and regulation that didn't, that didn't uh, exist previously. And once the exit option opens up, then law and regulation needs to be able to take that into account. And fourth and finally, a particular passion of mine, uh, the growth of political polarization. Because processes for generating law and regulation that make perfectly good sense during periods of consensual politics break down almost entirely during epochs of polarized politics. And I thought Congressman Cooper was particularly eloquent on that point. So with, you know, you know, with those four factors in mind and Phil and others to taste, uh, we can then proceed to ask the question, well, why do we have so many uh, obsolete laws, regulations, and procedures anyway. I'm not going to try to quantify it. I'm not going to try to say whether we're better or worse than our major developed country peers and, and competitors. But clearly, there is a problem here. Uh, and once again, I will offer four hypotheses very quickly. You know, first of all, we have a constitutional system whose primary purpose is the avoidance of tyranny tyranny by any concentrated power. And the unintended consequence of that is the tyranny of the status quo. Uh, second, uh, and Congressman Cooper again was eloquent on this point, uh, the, incentives are, the incentives are perverse. There are incentives to produce law and regulation, but very much weaker incentives, if any, to try to eliminate, uh, eliminate or prune away. Uh, Third, and this is where I think, uh, I, I think proposals like mandatory sunset laws may have an important role, there is a lack of enabling structures, particularly in the legislature, for pruning and weeding. But fourth, and I would just want to spend a minute on this as I wend my way towards my conclusion, our current regulatory strategy is designed to produce obsolete regulation. And let me try to explain what I mean by that. Let me begin with a general proposition. The more law or regulation focuses on the specification of means to ends, as opposed to the identification of the ends themselves, that is to say, the more regulations are what Philip Howard called rules-based as opposed to principle-based, the more likely they are to obsolesce. Because broad purposes, like, you know, produce, like protecting human beings from harmful pollutants, don't change. But the means to abate those nuisances will change quite, quite quickly. That raises my final question in this regress towards the ground. Uh, why do we have so much rules-based regulation? as opposed to principle-based regulation. I see John Kaminsky in the, in, in, in the audience. And this very question 
was at the heart of the Vice President Gore's uh, you know, famous National Performance Review, aka Reinventing Government. Back there we called it, you know, we, back, there, back then we distinguished between steering and rowing, but the idea was exactly the same. You know, the point of governance is to steer. It is not to try to row the boat. There are plenty of people who want to row the boat, and the only question is one, the only question is one of general direction. So to repeat, why do we have so much rules-based as opposed to principle-based regulation? Uh, and I will conclude with a point of history and a point of, uh, a point of current analysis. As, a, as an historical matter, uh, we are now functioning within a post-New Deal legislative paradigm uh, where the Congress crafts general, aka vague and imprecise laws. They are then parsed and implemented through regulation, and we have proliferated agencies to craft these regulations and to enforce them. Uh, but, and this is my peroration, there is constant pressure for ever more precise rules. Why is that? This, it seems to me, gets us to the heart of the matter. Philip Howard talks about the need for discretionary authority. The simple fact of the matter is that today there is intense fear of discretionary authority, the fear that it will be abused without a check. Uh, secondly, there is acute mistrust of regulated entities. The thesis is that corporations in particular will try to take advantage of every opportunity they have to evade the intended force or purpose of the regulation. And the only way you can, the only way you can pull against that is by creating a box with no escape hatches, right? ever more detailed regulation. The third, and this is particularly characteristic of agencies and also the Congress of the United States itself, the fear of being blamed for the mistakes that occur one or two percent of the time. You can make great congressional hearings and agency show trials out of the one or two percent mistakes. And as long as we have a system that's driven more by the mistakes than by the generality of successes, uh, we have a structural bias towards ever more precise rules. And finally, uh, there is, I think, with the rise of our modern judicial state, which, which, which parallels the growth of the modern regulatory state, an effort to make sure that individuals who have been harmed have precise grounds for legal redress of the harm and compensation for it. And the more precise rules are, the better suited they are to the legal process of alleging violations of rules and gaining compensation for people who allegedly have been harmed by the violation of the rules. So I think we really need to think very hard about the following conundrum. And that is, as I said, the more regulations are rules-based as opposed to principle-based, the more likely they are to become obsolescent. Uh, but the pressures for rules-based as opposed to principle-based regulation are intense. And up to this point, nobody has figured out a systemic way of resisting those pressures. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bill. That's a, uh, an excellent uh, summary. I'm glad it was uh, captured on tape. I've always thought, though, that the, that the distrust goes both ways. Not only do we distrust the regulated intensely, we think that every company is going to get away with everything, but the regulated distrust government intensely, so they want the rules precise uh -huh. so that there's no discretion at all by the, um, you know, by the regulators. So I have this image of both sides sort of painting themselves into the same corner you know, sort of looking at, and then being completely captured and unable to go anywhere and exercise your common sense in any situation, environmental review, you name it, because of this, uh, at this point, almost pathological cultural uh, distrust of anyone not to do whatever they want, but just even to have a measure of, of, of leeway to try to try to have a conversation about what makes sense. Um, so I do think, and it goes back to Senator Warner's point, that, that, that at some level we have a cultural problem, cultural problem of what's the, you know, how is government supposed to work? Where do you draw the line between the rule of law and, and administrative choices and such? And secondly, we also have the structural problem 
which is how do you implement all of that? You know, the, the specificity. I know, Don, you had a comment on. Yeah, I wanted well, to I, talk, talk a little bit about this uh, question that, that Bill put of uh, why are so much of our why is so much of our regulation uh, rules based? Um, I think the first point to make is that it's it's not all rules-based. I mean, we have both kinds of regulations. The, the, and going back to what Alan Morrison was talking about. Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. The, the, the key regulation on BP and the BP oil spill basically said, if you have an indication that the cement job may be failing, consider doing one of the four following tests. That was not a rules-based approach. Right. It was a very principle-based approach that gives a lot of discretion to the, to the operator. And if you look at environmental laws around the world, many of them that are very difficult to enforce are very vague in general. They're very beautiful. But the reason that there is an, impa uh, a, a, an imperative to turn things into relatively specific rules is that they're much easier to enforce and inspect. As a, as a former EPA official, you know, that's, that's the imp impediment. So you have to sort of strike a balance. But it's not also black. I mean, we have, for example, you said we haven't figured out how to solve this. I mean, we had the acid rain trading program, or trading programs generally. That is a really very flexible system. It just basically says there will be a 50% reduction in pollution, and it leaves it completely up to the affected utilities to trade and shift around burdens, and there's no specification of how they, uh, how they achieve it at all. But it's entirely enforceable. You have, to, you have to hold the allowances that match your pollution. So I, I do think there are techniques that have been developed, particularly economic incentives, that are both enforceable and maintain flexibility with regard to compliance. Great. Uh, maybe take a few questions. Um, in the back, Paula. Um, my name is Paula Gordon. I have a website called uh, gordonpublicadministration.com. And I've written an article that uh, compares uh, the, um, traces the similarities between the developments in um, theories of government and public administration and uh, Philip Howard's work. And that's on uh, that website. Um, and some of the answers to the questions that have been raised here uh, are, are um, noted there. Well, one of them has to do with a, a theory of uh, schizophrenia, of all things. Um, in a book called Existence, um, there is a concept of um, the um, etiology of uh, schizophrenia being caused by uh, the uh, absence of a sense of meaning and purpose. And that can result in rigid moralism. You can throw yourself into micro-legalism micromanagement. Uh, these are just some of the ideas, uh, that and some ideas from from um, Margaret um, or, or uh, Mary Parker Follett concerning the invisible leader, and I'll leave you with that concept. Um, if you um, have a sense of purpose and a common sense of mission, you don't have to pay attention to incentivizing and motivating people. It's there. That was at the basis of this nation when it was founded, and that's what we need to get back to, a sense of mission, a common sense of what is in the public good. And if we look at the preamble of the Constitution, I think we have a mission statement there to begin with. Interesting. I've always uh, wondered if somebody did a study about the rise of, of partisan rhetoric over the last few years and the decline of real authority. Uh, by the people in Congress, the sense that you can't make a difference. And so if you go in there and you give up, you know, nobody even bothers to know what the committees <laughs> what they are on do, then you know, what you have left is just rhetoric and, and you know, sort of bomb throwing. Anybody else comment on that? I'd just like to quickly say one of the difficulties is that many of the entities that you're trying to regulate today are themselves bureaucracies. Uh, and it's really hard when you're dealing with an inanimate organization to rely on the conveying of a sense of purpose of the, uh, of, of the organization. And I think you, you see that um, if you look, for example, at some of the things that happened in the BP oil spill or, or, or whatever. So 
we may need a different form of regulation when we're actually talking about people as opposed to when we're talking about complex organizations that we're trying to regulate. Interesting. Um, any other questions? Don Ross? My name is Don Ross. I'm, Are you a foreigner? I'm a foreigner. I'm a Canadian lawyer. <laughs> and uh, so I, I've, my background, therefore, is looking at these issues in a different context. And my, but my question is, um, in, in, today, the whole thesis seems to be new laws get passed, but old laws stay, stay on the books and they become obsolete. And I guess my question is, uh, why don't laws get revised? So some new things get added, some old things get taken away. Is it simply the power of the vested interests, or is there something else at play? Uh, sure, Jim. From a comparative perspective, it's because uh, the lawmaking authority in the United States is, is lodged in the Congress, and the ministries, or the departments here, aren't taking, don't have the ability or the responsibility to keep them current in a, in a, a, a ministerial system They'll watch what the, what's happening with the laws, and then they will see to it that they are periodically updated. Bill, uh, I would you know, I, I I think that's absolutely right, and I just I just add to that uh, that the the epicenter of dysfunction in the government of the United States today is the Congress of the United States, and it is obviously the Congress that has to go through that process of revision. Right now, we're in a situation uh, in which, for many reasons, our Congress is incapable even of discharging its routine annual responsibilities, let alone uh, looking back and looking forward to go through the process of revision. And the higher the transaction costs are for the revision of law, the lower the probability that Congress will undertake them. To, to make that as precise as possible, uh, if you have a Congress of the United States that isn't even in session, as Congress Co Congressman Cooper said, for more than a quarter of the days in the year, then the scarcest commodity is floor time for debate and deliberation on the House and the Senate, particularly in the Senate, because it doesn't have the kinds of restrictive rules that our House of Representatives does. So if you tell, if you tell the Senate Majority Leader, you're the chairman of a committee, you know, we have this great idea for reforming this particular law, but mm, Mr. Leader, it's going to be a little bit controversial, and it's going to take five days on the floor to get through this. And the Senate Majority Leader will say, are you nuts? Right? That's a very appreciable portion of the floor days I have available for discretionary decisions. I'm not going to spend them on this. And so we have a governance capacity issue in this country based on the fact that many of the remarks that have, made, have been made about the obsolescence of laws and regulations also apply to the rules and procedures of the Congress of the United States, which is why many of us are so determined uh, to push forward a comprehensive con congressional reform agenda, because most of what we've been talking about this morning won't happen unless Congress itself is reformed as the first order of business. Ryan, do you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I just want to second that point about floor time being at a premium, particularly as, uh, you know, tactics, as you mentioned, in the Senate, uh, you know, there's, there's a new 60-vote threshold, essentially. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, one of the things that Third Way has, has lit on in, in terms of pushing a biennial budget is you at least clear room in that second year and you sort of remove excuses for an action because we do have, you know, we relitigate these same appropriations issues every year. And I can tell you from, you know, that just June and July, you know, basically the, the floor is given over to the business of funding the government, even though you seemingly just had these discussions several months ago. Um, you know, meanwhile, you have, for instance, a multi-year transportation bill that's overdue, reauthorization of ESEA. So there, there, is, there, there, there is a need to create windows to actually go back and revise the laws um, and creating an off-year um, where you're not constantly just worrying about, which really is, you know, Congress's fundamental first purpose is, is really to get, you know, is, is to set, uh, you know, the spending levels. Uh, but, but it needs to do other things on authorization. And so carving out some of that floor time would help ease, ease some of that, that transaction cost. Um, two, more, two more questions. Um, people haven't asked questions. The gentleman in the back, 
Hi, I'm Eric from the uh, Center on Budget Policy Priorities here in Washington. This question is for uh, Professor Elliott. Um, it seems like you were talking about earlier how certain industries require the detailed regulation that are in place at the present. Um, and the reason I ask this is because I worked for a chemical waste transport company back in 2008. And uh, since you were uh, since you are on the board of an EHS uh, department for your law firm, I thought this would be most relevant to you. Uh, and while I worked there, it was absolutely essential to follow the regulations uh, that were in place to obviously keep the safety of the, the staff that was working uh, and, and of course the general public. So I'm, I'm wondering if, 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 uh, if that's what you were going towards, how some industries require the detailed regulation that are in place, um, but they also have the end goal which is keeping the general public safe or the uh, environment uh, in a general positive state of health. Is that, is that something that you were going towards? Yes, I think so, but I would add an additional dimension to it, which is, which is time. Um, I, I think uh, Rich Bury talked earlier about the trust issue. I mean, one of the reasons that we've got a lot of these detailed regulations is that there was a, a time when the industries that are being regulated were not really behaving properly in these in these areas. So, um, you know, I, I once wrote an article that starts out when when regulatory law succeeds, it puts itself out of business. So, what happened is we we didn't have mine safety companies being conscious of mine safety or chemical companies being conscious of disposing of hazardous waste. So you impose this very detailed uh, regime, which everybody thinks is the second best solution, but then maybe over time, you have to change it and, and lighten up. So one of the innovative things that's done is, you know, you impose a detailed system of regulation, but a company that can show, for example, that its injury rate is substantially below the national average, uh, this, is, this is one of the things that the Clinton administration did as part of the Gore Initiative. They were called performance-based off-ramps, which is not the best term, but basically the idea is that it's not just the industry, but it's, but it's where that industry is in the, in the state of development. See, a lot of these regulatory programs are activist state programs that are designed to change norms. They're tra designed to change, to, to eliminate you know, race discrimination. And so the, the kinds of detailed orders that you needed from federal judges, you know, in the 1960s when you're trying to change norms are not necessarily the same orders that you, or to the same degree that you need in a, in a, in a later state of society when some of the norms have changed. So I don't think it's an either or. I think it, I think there's a maturation to the, to the legal process, which is also something that, is very much part of the German uh, legal system that you you know that you you have a period of exploratory behavior, uh, and then over time uh, you may not need as much detailed regulation as you needed early early on to get the thing started. Okay, John Fortier, do you have a question? Last question. Sure. I, I guess I want to ask about the um, the place of federalism in this. Is federalism a, a help or or a hindrance in thinking about uh, some of these questions? Uh, certainly, I think w one view is uh, by devolving things to the states or lower level uh, governmental authorities are closer to the people, easier to change. But we find ourselves left with a lot of uh, middle ground uh, policies where uh, there's both responsibility in states and federal government in, uh, some would call them uh, uh, unfunded mandates or dual administered programs like Medicaid. What's the role in federalism? To make it harder to get rid of federal, uh, obsolete law, or in some ways does it make it easier? Well, uh, I'm going to turn to Jim Maxander. Tocqueville made the distinction between centralized government and centralized administration. Um, so you can have accountability all the way up to the top, but not tell everybody how to do things. So it's not inconceivable that you could have a role for both, but as Julie Barnes was suggesting, the, the Medicaid situation, the whole healthcare situation is just an unworkable nightmare. 
Jim? Justice Breyer has pointed this out about 15 years ago about the difference between American federalism and federalism in other places like Germany and the European Union. The model, Germany is a federal state just as we are, but they generally have one national law. It's implemented at the local level, so they're not separate authorities. So that way you have a consistency of the law, but you have an attention to the local uh, interests. And in the European Union, this is, of course, a big problem right now, too. And again, Breyer has pointed to this as, as a, a good place where we can see how other people are doing things because they have a principle of subsidiarity which tries to drive things down to the low, lower level and not have Brussels determine everything. But I, I think the best way seems to be to concentrate the legislative authority in a place where you can get a good set of rules but allow a certain uh, liberty in who's carrying that out.